This lecture will be the final lecture in our Launching the New Nation lecture series. This lecture will focus on Jefferson and Madison's administration, 1800 to 1812. With the election, this is a quick review from the previous lecture. Remember, the election of 1800 had Republicans nominating Jefferson and Burr, whereas the Federalists nominated the incumbent president, Adams. Jefferson and Burr will tie in the electoral votes, and so it's going to go to the House of Representatives to decide the final vote. Alexander Hamilton will put his support behind Jefferson, so Jefferson becomes president and Burr becomes vice president. This leads to the 12th Amendment, where voters will cast their vote for both the president and vice president on the same ticket. As one of Adams' last actions before he left office was the Judiciary Act of 1801, they got the nickname the Midnight Judges because he increased the number of judges by 16. John Marshall was the Supreme Court Chief Justice, and he was a staunch Federalist. And with the first Supreme Court case, Marbury v. Madison, for the first time, the court will use judicial review, where they will decide whether or not a law is constitutional. And they will decide that the, a component of the Judiciary Act of 1789 was unconstitutional. The part that said the Supreme Court had to enforce appointments because the Constitution it does not say that. Probably the biggest thing that Jefferson did during his administration. Let me backtrack. With the election of 1800, one of the things that Jefferson will say about this is he'll call it the Revolution of 1800. And one of the reasons why he calls it the Revolution of 1800 is because it is the first time that we see power train change peaceably from one political party to another. It goes from Federalist to Democrat Republicans. And the American people accepted this. They accepted that there was a new political party in place because the voting process worked. So it was another test of this new nation to see whether or not this new democratic process would work and whether or not we could shift power from one political party to another without there being blood being shed. And so with this revolution of 1800 or the election of 1800, it proved that this new nation and our democratic process could work. So the big thing that he's going to do during his administration, Jefferson, is the Louisiana Purchase. In 1800, Spain returned the land, uh, Louisiana, to France and to Napoleon. At this point, the U.S. lost the use of the Mississippi River in the port of New Orleans. Remember, we had access to that from the Pinckney's Treaty. Jefferson's fears about purchasing Louisiana. See, Napoleon needed money, so he's going to offer us to purchase it for $15 million. But Jefferson had some fears. Is this constitutional? It does not state in the Constitution that the United States can purchase land from other countries. And remember, Jefferson is a strict constructionist. He reads the, const the Constitution exactly as it was written. So if it's not written in the Constitution, then that's, a, that's reserved to the states. Or does this fall under the Necessary and Proper Clause because it's something necessary and proper for the nation? Also, can the President make this decision? Or does he need the support of Congress? Is this a congressional decision or a presidential decision? Where are the checks and balances in this? So in 1803, he decided that it was necessary and proper for the good of the nation because our agrarian farmers, our farmers on the western frontier in places like Kentucky and Tennessee, needed to be able to get their goods to market. And so we needed the Mississippi River and we needed the Port of New Orleans. So we're going to purchase Louisiana for $15 million. Jefferson wanted to know what his investment was, so he's going to hire Lewis and Clark in 1803. They got the nickname the Corps of Discovery. They traveled from St. Louis to the Pacific Ocean. It was about 50 soldiers and woodsmen, and Sacagawea, you may know her as Sacagawea, but the correct pronunciation is Sacagawea, will be their interpreter and guide. It took two years and four months. Now, Lewis and Clark took copious notes, and they sent back a lot of samples, including live animals, to the president. And so we had a lot of details about the path all the way to Oregon, and about what the land was like, what the natives were like, which is going to lead to, when we're expanding west and we're taking advantage of those territories, a lot of knowledge for the American people. Now, Britain is still creating problems for us. Despite Jay's treaty, impressment continues, where they're seizing Americans at sea and drafting them into the British Navy. You see, they're saying, look, you were a British citizen when you were born, so thus you should serve in the British Navy. We don't care that you're part of an independent country now. And so Jefferson responds with the Embargo Act of 1807. He bans exporting products to other countries and importing their goods and ceases all trade with Britain. This is a great idea, except for the fact that then international trade ends. 
So this is going to have long-reaching effects. One, initially, it's really going to hurt our country. Okay, our economy is going to be really hurt by this this embargo. But in the long run, it's going to end up helping our country because industry is going to grow in the north because the Americans are going to need to produce their own manufactured goods. But we're going to look at some of the sh short-run consequences of this particular uh, law. And one of the short-run consequences is the War of 1812. As we're engaging in the embargo, as we're dealing with British impressments, there's also wars being fought on the western frontier against American Indians. Tecumseh was a Shawnee chief, and he tried to remove whites from Shawnee land, so he negotiated with the British for assistance. Prophet was the brother of Tecumseh, and he led a Shawnee attack against William Henry Harrison and his troops. William Henry Harrison is going to strike back at the Battle of Tippecanoe, and he's going to win the victory. What's important about the Battle of Tippecanoe is not necessarily William Henry Harrison winning, though he is going to run for president on that platform of a war hero because he won this battle. But what's going to happen is we're going to find out that the Indians got all their guns from the British, which means the British are supporting an enemy on our soil. And so a group of Americans called the War Hawks, it was a group of senators and congressmen who really wanted us to go to war with Britain. It's either the Hawks or the Doves. So in this case, the American War Hawks are going to find out that the Indians got arms from, Brit from Britain, and so they're going to encourage declaring war. Madison will be elected in 1808, James Madison, the father of our Constitution, and in 1812, he's going to go to war with Britain. So the War of 1812, there's not a lot you necessarily need to know for the standards, so I'm just going to cover some of the big ones. At first, we try to go after Canadian territory, but we're actually going to have a lot of failures in Canada, and we're going to lose a lot of territory and only start to regain it at the end of the war. The strength of the British Navy is really going to hurt us. We're severely outnumbered, and though the U.S. Navy was successful in defeating British ships, the British Navy had set up an effective blockade against the U.S. So even though we might be better at defeating their ships, if we can't get our ships out to get goods and supplies, that's a problem. In 1814, the British will burn the White House and the Capitol. Remember during the war, or the Revolution, how I talked about the fact that we didn't have a capital, and since we could move around the Continental Congress, that it was very difficult for the British to cripple us? Well, in this case, we actually have a capital that they're able to burn. And though it doesn't cripple us, it does create a problem when we no longer have a capital or a government to run things from. Luckily, Madison and Congress were able to get away, but still it strikes a blow. However, technically after the, bat or after the war was over, we're going to have the Battle of New Orleans. January 8th, 1815, and this was a success by Andrew Jackson. He's going to get war hero status when he helps defeat the British at the Battle of New Orleans. Another victory that's not on here is the Battle of Fort William Henry, which was um, off the coast of Maryland. And Francis Scott Key is going to be watching that battle take place. It's a naval battle, and he's going to watch that battle take place, and he's going to see the American flag continue to stand over the fort. And inspired by some of these sites, he's going to write the Star Spangled Banner that night. So that's all coming from the War of 1812. The Treaty of Ghent will end the War of 1812. It'll be signed Christmas Eve, 1814. So you see Christmas Eve, 1814. You'll notice the Battle of New Orleans is January 8th, 1815. And so the Battle of New Orleans happened a couple weeks after the Treaty of Ghent was signed. But remember, it takes a couple of weeks for information to get from Britain to the United States. So we didn't know that the war was over when Jackson's going to win. It declares an armistice, which is a ceasefire. It does not address the issues of impressment or neutral shipping rights. We pretty much just agreed to stop fighting. And like, let's just go back to how things originally were. Um, and so later, with the Rush by Go Agreement, which will be in 1817, we're going to limit warships on the Great Lakes and establish the boundary of the Great Lakes. And so we're going to resolve a lot of the issues that were caused, that caused the War of 1812. In 1818, the 49th parallel will divide the upper half, of, or will set the border along the upper portion of the United States. At this point, the United States is pretty much considered an independent nation. With the Treaty of Ghent, the British have pretty much seized 
ceased their uh, beliefs that they could, you know, take us back over or, or sort of recolonize us. And at this point, we're able to shift into a new period of rising American nationalism, where we start to develop our own culture, our own identity, but also rising sectionalism, where we start to deal with issues where the North and the South don't necessarily get along and the West is developing, but it has its own needs and issues. That will be the next focus, a uh, next unit that we'll be focusing on our unit on nationalism, sectionalism, and sort of American identity.